Today on Know the Truth from Philip DeCourcy. God's good. Don't doubt it. As you look out on the devastation, as you try and see through the thick darkness, remind yourself, recall, theologically, experientially, historically, God is good. Don't doubt it. a medical diagnosis, a financial loss, or a personal crisis, we all go through seasons where everything seems to be falling apart. In those times, we might wonder, where is God? Why doesn't He intervene? Welcome to Know the Truth. I'm Wayne Shepherd, and today, Philip DeCourcy addresses the difficult seasons when suffering is prolonged and prayers seem to go unanswered. We're finding hope to carry us through the darkness as we continue our series. It's called Be Encouraged. I invite you to take your Bible and turn to Lamentations 3, verse 21 through 26. We're coming back to look at some verses we started to look at last week. A message called, Without Feel. We have a God who loves us, cares for us, and will provide for us without feel. Lamentations 3, 21. Jeremiah is speaking, This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I hope in Him. The Lord is good to those who wait for Him, to the soul who seeks Him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. So reads God's Word. You may be seated I love the stories told by Charles Swindoll, and one of my favorites is to do with a missionary who opens a letter from home, and inside the letter there's an encouragement, and there's a $10 bill. But as the missionary opened and read the letter and handled the money, she noticed looking out her window below her a man rather disheveled, who seemed to be in need of the money more than her, and out of Christian grace and love, she put the $10 bill in an envelope, and she wrote on the front of it, don't despair, and she threw it out the window, the man grabbed it, and off he went. Several hours later, there's a knock on her door, she opens it to find the man who was below her window who got the $10 bill, don't despair. And he was smiling, and he shoved into her hand a roll of dollar bills, And when she asked what they were for, he said this, that's the 60 bucks you won, lady. Don't despair, paid five to one. (laughs) I don't know if he got the message, but she got 60 bucks out of it. But I like that story, and it's a reminder that God has a message for us from Lamentations 3, 21 to 26. Don't despair. Don't give up. Wait for the sunshine of God in the darkness. Life might knock you down, but don't let it knock you out. Because God is unfailing in His love for you and for me. And that was the message we started to look at here last week in our series, Be Encouraged. Here we have the prophet Jeremiah seeking to find his footing in the midst of the devastation that's come with the Babylonians and King Nebuchadnezzar. It's 586 BC. And the city of Jerusalem has been raised to rubble. The temple has been destroyed. The very symbol of God's presence is now a symbol of God's absence. The people of God are at the point of starvation. There's even examples of cannibalism among the people of God. They're going to be carted off some 900 miles in exile to Babylon. This was their 9-11, so to speak. And in the middle of all of that, Jeremiah finds his footing. In the middle of that despair, he finds hope. In the middle of doubt, he expresses affirmation. In the middle of lament, he turns to worship. And we started to look at this great, great passage of God's Word. And I want to come back and, and look at it because its message is that our hope is founded on the fact that 
We believe in God's ability to keep being God. We need to know that. I think it was R.C. Sproul who said, God doesn't need me to be me for him to be him, but we need him to be him for me to be me. We need him. And we need to know that he has an ability to keep being himself so that his mercies and his compassions cease not, so that new every morning we encounter and experience his great faithfulness. So we started to work through the text under four headings, weeping, weighing, worshiping, waiting. We started to look at his weeping, didn't we? Verses 1 through 19, we backed up into the early part of the chapter and we saw that Jeremiah here is documenting his anguish in the present darkness. We have a series of laments, crying out to God in complaint, pleading with God to show mercy in the midst of his judgment, to shine some light into the darkness. We looked at those verses and we saw God's sovereignty, God's severity, God's silence. He was wrestling with that and it caused him to express honest lament before God. And we looked at the whole issue of lament, what it is, what's its pattern, why do it. But I want to come back to this thought of God's sovereignty, because that was one of the things we noticed, didn't we? As you work through the first 19 or 20 verses of this chapter, there's a little phrase that almost begins every verse. He has led me and made me to walk in darkness. He has aged my flesh. He has besieged me. He has set me in dark places. He has hedged me about. He has blocked my way. Jeremiah is talking about God. God has done this. Not Satan, but God. And you see the sovereignty of God in all of this. God's sovereignty over Judah's suffering. The weeping prophet here, Jeremiah, acknowledges that God has done this. That the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. The Lord blesses and the Lord curses. And the nation of Israel was warned back in Deuteronomy 28, if they failed to obey and keep covenant with God, He would scatter them. Actually, their judgment, their scattering, the situation they're in, is actually an evidence of God's great faithfulness. But even in the evidence of his faithfulness and cursing, they pivot to the idea if he's faithful in cursing, he's faithful in blessing. And if we repent, we can return and be restored. But I just want you to see the sovereignty of God. In fact, scroll down to verse 38. Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that woe and well-being proceed? Interesting verse, isn't it? Almost like Job, shall we not receive evil from the Lord, having received good? And you'll notice here this idea, is it not from the mouth of the Lord? That speaks of origin. The mouth of the Lord speaks of origin because everything finds its origin in God's speech. He spoke the worlds into existence. It was the word from the beginning that created all living things. This speaks of origination. So all of our woe and all of our well-being originates with God. Sovereignty and suffering. And we need to distinguish between secondary causes and primary sources. We need to remind ourselves that God stands behind all that goes on in our lives. He has either specifically determined it or graciously permitted it. But there are no accidents, only appointments in your life and my life. Joseph is a clear example. As his brothers betrayed him, it led to his time in a pit, in his time in a prison, which was the back door into the palace. And he lives long enough to see God working all things together for good. God sent him ahead to preserve Jacob and the sons of Jacob, the very brothers that had betrayed him. And when they meet him in that day and they're expecting the axe to fall and Joseph to wreak revenge, he says, hey, you meant it for evil? That's the foreground. That's the second because the brothers plotting his death and then selling him into slavery. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. That's the background. You've got the secondary cause, the brothers. You've got the primary source, the sovereign God, who purposed to keep covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. My friend, this week I was listening to John Blanchard, an English evangelist. You've got his little book, perhaps, in your home, Ultimate Questions. You maybe read several of his books. He's an excellent commentary on James. He went to be with the Lord in recent years. I listened to a message of him in Lamentations 3 and was really encouraged 
And he said something that made me come back and double down on our first point on the sovereignty of God. And he said this, you and I need to realize that in the incidents and accidents of life, we must look beyond the one who brings them to the one who sends them. Who brought this destruction? Who brought this darkness? Who caused this depression? Well, what about King Nebuchadnezzar? Yep. What about the Babylonian soldiers? Yes. They brought it, but God sent it. He has. He has done this. And it's a good distinction. It's something you and I need to just keep in mind. I thought it was a really good point. And as you go through life and you go through incidences and accidents and you go through challenges, look beyond the one who brings it to the one who sent it. And he sent it for a purpose. Maybe he sent it to bring you to faith in Jesus Christ, to awaken you from your sleep. Maybe he sent it to sanctify you and bring you to a greater depth of dependence upon him. Maybe he sent it to cause you to repent. But look beyond the one who brings it to the one who sent it. That's helpful. In fact, to illustrate that, John Blanchard draws an analogy to the postman. I don't know if it was ever the case here because our meal comes in a letterbox outside our home. We have to walk off the street to. Very inconvenient here in the United States. But back in Britain, you had a letterbox in your front door. And the postman literally came up to your front door and posted the letter. You get up in the morning or whenever he delivered it, and there would be your letters and mail inside your home, lying on the floor of your hallway. And Blanchard, drawing on that, says, you know what, if the postman would happen to drop a card through your door, and it's a birthday card, and someone sent you a gift in the birthday card, you don't run out the door, chase the postman down the street, and give him a kiss. Because he brought it, but he didn't send it. Or if he doesn't post you through the mailbox a birthday card, but rather a bill, and it says he keeps giving you bills... And you get annoyed with this guy, so you chase him down the street and you don't kiss him this time, you kick him this time. But you you wouldn't do that, right? Because he brought the bill, but didn't send it. And Blanchard said, we need to remind in the foreground of our lives, whoever's hurting us, whoever's bringing disruption into our lives, you've got to look beyond the one who brings it to the one who sends it. And that's the beginning of Jeremiah's pivot. And then we move from his weeping to his weighing. That was verses 19 through 21. In fact, if you back up to verse 19, remember my affliction. If you have an NIV, it gives you the impression that it's Jeremiah speaking to himself. I remember my affliction. But I like the New King James, and I like the translation, remember my affliction. Jeremiah is asking God to remember. The covenant-keeping God, the God who remembers His covenant. Job 7, verse 7. And that triggers in him a desire to remind himself of the God who remembers. And in verse 21, he says, This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies, we will not be consumed. So what he recalls to mind is what we have in the verses that follow, the character of a covenant-keeping God. And he brings his mind to that, and he focuses there so that he can kind of begin to shut out the darkness and the depression and begin to focus on the light and the hope and the promise that's to be found in his relationship with God. And we need to do that. We talked about that. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on that. But we need to remind ourselves often. The word remember is found throughout the book of Deuteronomy. The idea of remember is found throughout the book of Psalms. First Peter is written to remind us of good things. Later on, we have the Lord's table to remind us of Christ's never-dying love for us. We're very forgetful. C.H. McIntosh, an old brethren writer who's actually worth reading, once said something like this. I'm paraphrasing, but it's close. 10,000 mercies can be forgotten in one trifling moment. Isn't that true? 10,000 mercies can be forgotten in one trifling moment. And so you and I need to work hard at remembering the things of God and building memorials and Ebenezer stones in our mind to His faithfulness and His goodness and mercy that follows us all the days of our life. We looked at His weeping. We looked at His weighing. Now I want you to come back and pick up where we were beginning to work through His worshiping. This is the heart of the book. 
Verses 21 to 26 is at the heart of the book of Lamentations. And in Hebrew poetry, often the centerpiece of the piece is the central message. And this is the central message. In the midst of despair, there can be hope. In the midst of lament, we ought to worship. And so you have this mood that's now broken. This mood of despair is broken and replaced and displaced with a beautiful affirmation of hope founded on the character of God. Remember, the ultimate hope for God's people is the thought of God's ability to remain God. And we we started to look at that. What we've got here in these verses is a diamond in a pile of coal. Now, before we go back to the idea of God's mercy, compassion, and faithfulness, again, just studying this week, listening to several guys, reading several comedies, something hit me afresh that I don't want you to miss. And it's this the context of what we're about to look at for a few moments here. When he says, through the mercies of the Lord, we're not consumed. When he says, God's compassions don't feel. When he says, God is faithful. Remember the background. Remember the context. Staggering, isn't it? They had just gone through 18 months of being besieged by the Babylonians, which led to their defeat. And during that 18 months of siege, Some had even turned to the idea of eating their dead children. It was their 9-11. This was a low moment in the history of Judah. They would soon be carted off some 900 miles to exile in Babylon. And they would sit by the rivers of Babylon and weep. Remember that in the Psalms? In fact, in verse 17, you have moved my soul far from peace. I have forgotten prosperity. That can be translated, I have forgotten how to be happy. That's where he's at. He has forgotten how to be happy. But in the middle of that, he confesses, addressing God himself, great is your faithfulness. I tell you, that's a stunning affirmation given the context. And you know what? Confessions of faith are great things. And the content of them is very important. And you've got a beautiful confession here. God's loyal love and covenant mercy. God's motherly compassion. God's unending faithfulness. The content of this confession is great. But I'll tell you another thing. The contents and the timing of it's even greater. It's one thing for these guys to write a confession in the air-conditioned rooms of the Master's Seminary. But in the days to come, their greatest confession will be worked out in Colombia with Santiago and in France with James because the context and the time will be different. But their confession of faith and their faithfulness to the faithfulness of God will be greater. I want to remind you that maybe in the midst of your darkness once, in the midst of your oppression, and you kind of squeak out an expression of love for God, and your trust in Him in the midst of it all, that might be your greatest confession. Better than anything you'll ever say here amidst the congregation of God's people on a good day. So always remember that the content of a confession is important, but the content of the confession shines all the more when you look at its time and context. Singing in the midst of hurt, preaching in the midst of fruitlessness, ministering in the midst of discouragement, believing in the midst of unbelief, praying in the midst of God's silence, that's faith that's more precious than gold, having been tested by the fire. In fact, Dale Ralph Davis in a sermon in Lamentations 3 tells of a Christian woman in China around about 1937-38 and she encountered some China inland missionaries who had gone out from Hudson Taylor and she said to these missionaries, but I will not let go of Jesus. That's good. And I'll bet you you've said that. That's a good confession and I think it's commendable and we probably all have said something close to it. At some point, I'm not going to let go of Jesus. I'm going to take up my cross and follow Him. But when you understand when she said it, And we understand the context of her confession, the rampaging Japanese army, the heartless and cruel soldiers of imperial Japan. They burned her house twice to the ground. Four of her six relatives were killed. Her brother was branded with a hot iron. Her daughter-in-law was shot before her very eyes. Her grandson died of hunger and exposure. Now I hear those words again, but I will not let go of Jesus. It's not just the content, my friend. It's the timing when you say it. And 
Lamentations and Jeremiah says it in a context of darkness and devastation. And it's all the more glorious. Now, we started to look at three things, only one of them, the nature of God's person. And then we were hoping that today to look at the newness of God's provision and the notability of God's portion. We looked at the nature of God's person. We covered God's mercy, chesed, love, God's loyal love, God's covenant love toward us. We reminded ourselves that God always acts in the light of His covenant love toward us. Not in the light of what we do, but more in the light of who He is and what He has committed to love His people for and with. But then we looked at God's compassion Hebrew word womb, and we identified this idea in an analogy. God's love to us is like, you know, the unfailing compassion of a mother. No one loves us more than our mothers. It's just a fact. Now we're at God's faithfulness as we look at the nature of his person. And you'll notice that now Jeremiah is talking directly to God. Because you see, you can't talk about God in any meaningful way and it be authentic and real without soon talking to him. And Jeremiah says, great is your faithfulness. This is God's immutability. This is God's unchanging love. This is the fact that there is no shadow of turning with him, no fluctuation. His love remains, his mercy abides, his power surges, his patience continues. You see, his throne has been established in heaven forever. His word is settled in heaven In fact, he's often described as a rock in the Psalms, isn't he? Which connotes strength and stability. And as with Jeremiah, so with us, it's a wonderful thing in a world of broken promises, in a world of fluctuating markets, in a world that is constantly turning and churning. It's a marvelous thing to wake up in the morning to the faithfulness of God. I always love Psalm 3 where the psalmist says, And I awake and I am still with you. It's kind of... You're still with me, which means I'm still with you, because it all begins with you. Love that. You wake up in the morning and you remind yourself, I'm still with him. Nothing will separate me from his love. I'm going to feed on his faithfulness. So every time you see a rainbow, let that remind you of the faithfulness of God, because God is faithful. God's promises will come to pass without fail. An encouraging reminder today from Philip DeCourcy on Know the Truth. If you're in need of further encouragement, we have a few resources I'd like to bring to your attention. First, if you've missed any of the previous messages in this series called Be Encouraged, you'll find the complete study online at ktt.org or on the KTT mobile app. You can listen at your own pace and share your favorite messages with friends or family who might be in need of an uplifting message. Then we also have a book we recommend titled Pathways to Peace, Facing the Future with Faith. These meditations from Isaiah 40 will help you face the future with courage, relying on God's presence and preeminence. Tomorrow may be full of uncertainties, but we know God holds all of time in His hands and we trust in His plan. We'd love to send you a copy of this refreshing book, and it comes with our thanks for your support of this program. Know the Truth is made possible by the generous support of your fellow listeners. So as you've been blessed by the teaching on this program, we invite you to pass that blessing forward by giving today. Here's the number to call, 888-644-8811, or give online at ktt.org. Remember to request the book, Pathways to Peace. Finally, if you're new to Know the Truth, we have another resource we'd like to send you completely free of charge. It's a brand new devotional by Philip DeCourcy called Seven Days of Truth, Resting in God's Providence. It's available when you get in touch for the very first time. Look for the devotional online at ktt.org. I'm Wayne Shepherd, inviting you to join us next time when we'll continue finding encouragement from God's Word right here on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Mm